whilst we're getting started. So, uh, introductions, uh, that's me. Um, I am uh, Head of Project Controls for um, No Terms Crossing, which is a uh, housing project. Terry Harrington was talking um, briefly about it um, this morning. Um, I'm also Head of Program and Project Controls for Arcadis in the UK, and uh, Cascade is the joint venture between Arcadis, CH, 2 uh, and Covey, and uh, we are the technical partner to Highways England on the project. Uh, so, um, talking about low terms crossing and um, adding value through the project, uh, this is about realising the road investment strategy, again following on from what Terry was saying. Um, the preferred route announcement was made uh, by Chris Grading in April um, this year. Um, we, uh, it's a critical investment in national infrastructure. It's part of um, the government's um, wider road investment strategy. Uh, we're in RIS 1, uh, RIS 2, uh, which is the next five year period is coming up. Um, and it will fundamentally change the landscape of uh, the southeast of uh, England. Um, the objective is to improve journeys, um, create new connections, improve the network. Um, and manage um, the um, capacity in the southeast of England uh, around the Dartford crossing. Uh, so, um, a little quiz. How many bridges are there across the River Thames? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Any advance on five? I'll start an auction. <laughs> Over 200. Um, any idea how many tunnels there are under the Thames? You can include underground. No, going the other way now. 27. Uh, there are six public ferries. Uh, there's one cable car link. Um, and one Ford. I have no idea where that is. However, uh, when you look at that map, um, you can see a lot of that is... Uh, concentrated around uh, central and the west end of London and the western end of the river. Um, there is only one crossing uh, on the east end of London, and that's Dartford Crossing. Um, when that is congested and when that fails, the only detour routes are 30 miles to the west through the Blackwall Tunnel, which means going into London, or 117 miles round the M25. So there is a significant um, challenge with the road infrastructure as it exists at the moment, um, which is part of the business case for uh, lower terms crossing. Um, so that's a little bit about the problem statement, but there's also a massive opportunity. Um, there are um, a significant number of uh, businesses and uh, inf infrastructure and um, freight and passengers who travel through this area. Uh, so in terms of size and scale, um, this is the preferred route that was announced uh, by Chris Grayling in April. Um, this comprises of something like um, 23 kilometres of new roads and uh, the tunnel itself is roughly three and a half kilometres of tunnel under the River Thames. Um, it's expected to cost uh, somewhere between 4.4 and uh, 6.2 billion pounds. Um, although, as Terry was saying earlier, we're, we're through, going through the early stages of design at the moment, so um, that cost still has to be firmed up. Um, and as I said, there's a, a huge number of um, economic benefits that um, we'll bring um, to the local area. So we've got um, Crossways Industry Park. Um, which is a development over the next um, 20 years that will create 40,000 jobs and 30,000 new homes. Um, Paramount Park, which is an entertainment resort and hotels um, that will create 8,500 jobs. Um, the construction alone will have 6,300 people um, working on it. Ebbsfleet Garden City um, is expected to create 15,000 new homes and 32,000 jobs. Um, and the Port of Tilbury um, and Tilbury 2 um, expects to double their goods handling over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, and Eurotunnel 
which is obviously a bit further down to the south, uh, expects um, an increase of 4 million passengers and 2 million trucks by 2020. So if you think about that, it's an opportunity, but in terms of the existing challenges when Dartford is congested and what the alternatives are, there's a huge problem and opportunity there. Um, and it's uh, massively interesting to the people in the local area. Um, we did our consultation in 2016 um, and received 47,000 responses um, from residents and businesses, um, which is the largest response that Highways England have had to a consultation. So it has significant potential, and that gives you a bit of an insight into the size and scale and complexity of the enterprise. So we're going to be ambitious. Um, this is it's a flagship project. Um, the Highways England uh, RIS 1 uh, CIP um, budget is £15.2 billion. Pounds. This project is potentially around half of that. It's a, a massive enterprise. Um, it will be the largest tunnel in Europe and it will be the fourth largest tunnel in the world once it's completed. Um, so it's a, a pretty significant piece of work. Um, we're going to create the um, resilience to relieve the congestion of the Dartford Tunnel. Um, we are going to provide um, the network for all of that traffic and all of those new homes and all of those residents um, to enable them to move through the area. Um, and we need to safeguard it uh, for the latest technology. In July this year, the government announced that they wanted to um, stop any new um, petrol or diesel engine vehicles going on the roads. So we have to consider the implications of those kind of big strategic decisions by the government on, uh, in the design of the project so that it safeguards for that future. Electric vehicles, um, driverless cars, what do all those things mean? Um, so this is about supporting the future. Um, it's um, supporting the government's agenda for building for the future. Um, but it's also about uh, providing employment and education and capability to people in the local area. Um, there are nine universities um, in this area. Um, the population growth is expected to increase by about 6%, about 4 million people um, over um, the lifetime of this project. So there's huge potential with a project of this size and scale to deliver some really significant benefit. Um, it's also interesting um, that, I mean, we've got loads and loads of statistics. Uh, I could go on forever. Um, there are uh, nearly 400,000 businesses in the local area, and the density of, of the number of businesses is about 86 per thousand people. Nationally, it's about 82 per thousand. So there's an awful lot of business. There's an awful lot of freight that travels through there, an awful lot of passengers who travel through the region. Um, and a lot of that is traveling up towards the north of England um, as uh, part of the government's northern powerhouse. So we've got a challenge in how we mobilize our resources um, so that we can efficiently and effectively um, support this growth and take advantage of the opportunities in, with the right timing um, to achieve the widest possible benefit. So, um, our delivery plans um, is, uh, consist of these things. Uh, we're going to have a supportive network of suppliers. What that means um, for us from a project controls perspective is we need to have a collaborative and open environment with which people can easily share information. We want to be able to reach out to local supply chains to help local businesses um, benefit from the investment that we're making. Um, that means finding ways for small companies to be able to win contracts, um, be part of the project. Um, those kind of businesses don't have the big systems and capabilities that um, the major construction companies have. But it's important that we involve those people because that's how we start giving uh, benefit back into the local area. Um, authenticity and relationships. Um, we've got, as Terry was talking about earlier, we've, we've got a really complicated stakeholder map, um, a huge number of interested um, parties. We've got um, Treasury, 
um, DFT, uh, who are the ultimate sponsors of this. Um, we've got the Infrastructure Projects Authority. Um, we've got Highways England Internal Governance. We've got all of the local borough councils, district councils, parish councils, uh, all of those universities, um, all of the local businesses, uh, individuals whose lives may be affected by the route that we want to take um, for this. Uh, it's absolutely critical that we get the structure of the project right um, so that we are able to gather the data and record the feedback that we get. Um, we've just gone out um, with our, second, uh, our next consultation um, to everybody within the red line boundary from the project. Um, so we're expecting significant numbers of responses. As I said before, we had 47,000 responses before. We have to be able to demonstrate um, that we um, have reviewed all of those and taken all of those into account because people have a right to have their voice heard. If it's going to affect them, we need to be able to show um, how we've managed that. And we have to be able to show how we're going to deliver value for money. Um, so collaboration across teams. Um, we have a very diverse team. Not only do we have um, the three parties in the JV and Highways England as the client, um, we also make full use of, of uh, remote facilities. So we have people in Poland, Romania, Mexico, uh, India, uh, the Philippines, all providing um, work and doing work for us within the project. Uh, so that's um, just within the project. Um, then we need to manage the relationships with all those different stakeholders, the governance process up through Highways England. As Terry was talking earlier, the stage gate and assurance review process, which is the Highways England life cycle process. Um, it has four phases and seven stages, and we have to be able to provide constant assurance as we go through the process back up into uh, the client organisation um, so that Highways England, DFT and Treasury are all confident um, that we are delivering value for money along the way. Um, innovation and technology enhancements. Um, we have people on the project who can write apps. I have no idea how they do it. Um, but we need to make full use of all of this technology. There are so many new types of technology uh, available to projects. Um, you've got um, applications that scan PDFs of drawings and can tell you the difference between the two versions of the drawings really quickly and simply. Um, there's phenomenal opportunities out there to harness that kind of technology. If you put that with all of those universities and schools and local education opportunities, there's a real opportunity for us to engage the local communities to help us, but also to help them in delivering the project and creating a lasting legacy of capability um, in the local communities. Um, and then you get into virtual reality and augmented reality. You can do um, simulated fly-throughs of the preferred route um, so that you can see where the third-party infrastructure is, um, all the electricity pylons and cables. Um, it, it, it's quite amazing the, the things that you can do now with this technology that help you to um, assimilate the information and provide a better quality uh, response. So we're working out how we incorporate all of that stuff, um, which is above and beyond my head. I have to get my kids to program the DVD player for me and my phone. Um, uh, sustainability. Um, so it's really important that not only is the solution that we deliver sustainable um, and that we have the absolute minimum impact on the environment, but it's also important that we provide some sustainable legacy to Highways England as well. As I said before, this project is um, the significant part of the complex infrastructure programme within Highways England. Um, it is of a size and scale that is much bigger than any of the other projects that they've got. The resources and the capabilities that we need to manage the project, we have to be able to make sure that those are available and embedded and useful to Highways England for future projects um, after we have um, completed this job. That has to be um, one of the defining factors of the project. But it's also sustainability for the local businesses, the local um, communities, so that um, the legacy that we leave behind isn't something where people have benefited while we were <coughs> spending money on the project. It's something that people are to continue to benefit from. The skills that they learn, um, the work that they do, 
the benefit that that brings to the community has to be um, a lasting benefit. Um, and uh, excellent design. Um, as I said before, uh, we're, we're designing um, uh, the roads and the tunnels. Does anybody know what the, um, this is a really geeky question, sorry. Does anybody know what the asset life cycle for these kind of tunnels is? How many? 100, yeah. yeah. You could use 120, but use 100. So Dartford Tunnel, for example, the asset life cycle should be 100 years. It's 50 years old. It's already struggling in terms of capacity. Um, so when you think about we're in 2017, um, we've got all this technology, the pace of change of technology, and we're trying to design something that has an asset life cycle of 100 years. It, it is a significant challenge. Um, and a lot of it is about trying to safeguard how you do that. Um, the important thing from a project controls perspective is providing the platform and the information and the means for people to be able to do that work and for us to be able to measure how we're doing it so we can demonstrate both to the government because it's uh, funded by the government predominantly but also for the communities how we're spending that money and ultimately it's taxpayers money which is it's your money and it's mine so we all want to know that it's being spent in the right way um, <clears throat> so as I said um, what are our challenges? It, it, this, the complexity and scale of the scheme um, is, is above and beyond anything that certainly Highways England have done before. It is one of the two or three biggest projects in the country um, that are currently operating. Um, it is a massive draw on resources um, and materials and plant, um, and it will be as we go forward. Um, so there'll be thousands of people involved in working on the project when it moves into construction. Um, we need to be working now to make sure that those resources and those people are available to work on the project because we'll be competing with HS2, we'll be competing with Crossrail 2, we'll be competing with whatever the next uh, major project is. Um, as I said, we need to meet the needs of the communities. Um, we have to have complete transparency and traceability in everything we do. Every single one of those 47,000 people who responded to the previous consultation have a right to know um, that we've considered what they had to say. Um, every single one of those people who we've written to now in, in, within the red line boundary as a landowner um, has to understand their rights, they have to understand what their options are, they have to understand um, how we're going to take into their, their views into account. Um, but it's also um, thinking about the community within the project. We have a one team approach in the project, so um, the whole of the project team, both the client representatives and uh, our team are all in one office together and we work together as, as a, in a one team concept and we work hard at making sure that people understand that we're here for the project. Ultimately, everybody on the project is there to deliver the project. Um, everything else in terms of Cascade or Arcadis or CH or Covey or Highways England comes secondary. It's about how do we work together to deliver the project. Um, it's about improving performance both uh, for the road network um, Again, you know, we've, we've got the challenge of understanding how we are going to impact the Dartford Tunnel and relieve the congestion there. Um, and how are we going to integrate this new road system into that network so that it improves um, capacity? Um, we've got to be able to um, demonstrate innovation. Um, we've got to be able to demonstrate efficiency. Um, we've got to be able to demonstrate the value and the durability of what we're designing because we're designing for something that's going to be there for 100 years. Um, as I said before, um, it's about um, understanding how we're going to maintain the, the road network um, while these changes take place. So we're going to be crossing um, the M2, we're going to be crossing um, the A14 north of um, the river. Uh, we're going to be creating um, a number of new junctions with other roads. Um, all of that existing traffic from all of those people in those communities um, still have to be able to go about their business. They still have to be able to get their kids to school. They've still got to be able to go to work, do all of those things whilst we're coming through creating this infrastructure. We have to be able to plan that in a way that minimizes that disruption and creates the greatest possible opportunity for benefit. Um, and um, we need to figure out how to finance the scheme. Again, Terry was talking earlier. Um, about this is likely to be a mixture of public and private finance. Um, 
it is a um, huge project um, that's going to require significant response from uh, big international companies that have the ability to take on this kind of um, funding um, and deliver uh, the the, uh, the tunnel in the road. So from a, I couldn't I couldn't do the whole presentation without getting some project control diagrams in there, uh, despite what the comms people were trying to make me do. Um, so um, in terms of control of information, um, you know, th this will be uh, very familiar. It's a classic um, cycle of having. Uh, the right systems, tools, processes and templates. Um, for us it's also about integrating some of the tools that, that might not normally be integrated. So the customer relationship management database, um, the grand investigation the survey information, all of this information, um, all of the ecological surveys, going out and surveying newts and bats and all the other um, interesting um, multi-legged creatures that um, are going to be within the boundary of, of um, where we're planning to work. All of that information has to be assimilated, has to be presented back. We have to do that in a way that is easy for people to understand and relate to, bearing in mind that our audiences range from the general public right through to ministers of state. Um, fundamental part of this is configuration control of key project documents. So we have client scheme requirements for preliminary design, which is what we're in at the moment. We have a project management plan. We have all the other key documents. Keeping configuration control of those documents so that the design teams can progress through design. We can incorporate the feedback from the stakeholders, from the consultation um, efforts that are going on at the moment. Um, but maintain control over the um, basis of design and the scope that we're delivering is really, really important. Change control um, is absolutely fundamental on a project of this size and scale. Getting that right and keeping control of it and managing those stakeholders and their expectations. You know, I'm sure everybody's been on a project where you've had a multitude of stakeholders who all want you to incorporate their latest um, ideas and thoughts and requirements. And we have some fairly big, powerful stakeholders um, who are very keen for us to do that. Um, and ultimately, it's about finding the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, <coughs> which um, I've never managed to do. But um, keeping integration and control over all of these different elements is critical for us being able to maintain confidence in the information that we're providing um, to Highways England, to those stakeholders, to the communities, um, maintaining the integrity of how the design is progressing, with how the consultation is progressing, with how the engagement with DFT um, and Treasury is progressing, with being able to be in the best possible position for when we are audited. I'm sure at some point, you know, we will we'll enjoy the benefits of um, a number of different audits, NAO, uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll take an interest. IPA always get interested as we're going into the um, stage and assurance review process. Um, all of those things should be second nature if you are able to retain control of those documents, those key project documents. Um, configuration of um, the work breakdown structure, cost breakdown structure. They all sound really simple and they are. Keeping control of them can be incredibly hard. Um, so, key steps. Um, Terry showed this slide earlier, so for those of you who are here, um, you'd already seen it, but um, these, are the, these are the key steps. And one of, one of the important things from a project controls perspective is, um, at the moment we're in preliminary design, that is a, a predominantly resource-based, it would be. Um, however, as the project grows and evolves, we are going to need to start implementing um, more complex integrated tool sets and capabilities working out the right time to engage with those, um, those sets of software and integrating them is fundamentally important. Um, so at the moment, we're living in a fairly uncomplicated world, um, but we are reaching the point where we can see the volume of information that we're dealing with is, is starting to grow. Um, we need to be looking at um, those integrated tool sets so that as we move out of 
um, this kind of early phase and into the later phases we've got control of the data and integrity of the information and how those schedules roll up um, to ultimately you've got that kind of one page level zero schedule that usually exists in Visio or PowerPoint or something like that that is the tool that you use to communicate with. Um, so um, broadly speaking you know that, that, that's a 10 year program. Um, as Terry said earlier there, there are fixed periods we go into statutory consultation um, middle of next year that's a fixed period of time uh, through which we have to go that then DCI application again is a fixed period so part of the challenge that the project has is how do we sequence the activity so that we've got meaningful and constructive things that we're doing whilst we're going through that external consultation process and that DCI application it's really important to the project that we go into those things in the best possible way, having fully engaged with everybody who's got an interest, um, so that we can come out of those with everybody aligned uh, around the outcomes that we need. Because as soon as we come out of them, then we need to start um, getting seriously into those kind of procurement activities, uh, the enabling works, the um, third party infrastructure works. Um, you know, you've, you've got significant investment programs that um, the, the big statutory undertakers have we need to fit in with those um, and not least of all um, we've got to go and buy some pretty big tunnel boring machines and um, they don't come on the back of a lorry <laughs> well they do sort of but they come in a number of pieces um, so um, again this is not an isolated solution um, it's really really important that we get the message across that lower terms crossing is part of an integrated network solution for Highways England. Um, it's adding capacity to a very constrained part of the road network. Um, it's creating opportunities for future generations um, of people to um, use that road network in a, in a much more effective and efficient way. Um, and it's not just about that route. Um, we're investing money in other parts, associated parts of the road network, because if you think about it, we're going to dump a huge, great road and tunnel on top of the existing network. We've got to find a way to integrate that so that it's a smooth transition into operation. And you don't do the classic, which happens a lot, where you create massive capacity and you know, great capability, and then you move a little bit down the street and you get the same dodgy old um, tired set of assets in another part. You know, it's... Um, when you're, when you're um, refurbishing buildings, it's the same thing. You refurbish part of the building, you walk out of that and you go into the old part that's not refurbished and you go, wow, it, you know, you've lost the benefit. Um, and um, we need to work with the local highway authorities to identify further improvements and further opportunities. Again, you know, coming back to um, this, this is a massive project. Um, we've got significant resources at our disposal. We need to find the way that we get absolute benefit for local communities. Um, for Highways England out of that and we leave that lasting legacy um, so finally that's what a tunnel boring machine looks like and you can see that, that's, uh, that's um, a 17 metre diameter tunnel boring machine which is approximately what um, the, the two tunnels will be under the Thames when we bore them for low Thames crossing about three and a half kilometres um, Two of those machines potentially, one starting on the north, one starting on the south, passing each other as they go under the Thames. And those things come in bits, and you have to dig some pretty big launch chambers, and then you drop them into the ground and rebuild them, and then off they go. Um, so, any questions? Hello. Are they going to be what, sorry? Are they going to be told? Told. Oh, told. Uh, yes. Yes, it will be. That was easy. Any other questions? Hello. How are we future-proofing project control systems? Yep. 
Um, that's a really interesting question. So, um, it, it, when you consider that this is uh, of an order of magnitude um, much bigger than anything else, um, Highways England um, have in train at the moment, um, there is a risk that the kind of systems and tools that we need for this project, um, they won't need for another project. I mean, there are potentially future projects that may be as big or bigger, but we don't know how far away they are. So part of the process for us is understanding what systems and tools and capabilities um, Highways England has in existence already that we can use, and then where we need to supplement that. Is that something that we supplement for the project, but we do it in a way that it's for the life cycle of the project and then we dismantle it and, it, you know, it, it no longer exists as a capability, or is it something that we can leave with Highways England as a, as a legacy capability? Um, what's more important, I think, is, is the information. Um, because you can use whatever system and tool you like. What's important, for, particularly for the client organisation, um, is the information that you leave behind. So we need to make sure that, that we leave, once the project's completed and disbanded, we leave Highways England with the legacy information, which they can then use to help them improve and inform future projects and future capabilities. Um, so as we go forward, we are going through a whole process. And in fact, um, Highways England have a uh, major projects change program and part of that is about systems and tools so we're working with them and there's an opportunity for them that we can use um, the capacity of Lower Thames Crossing as a project to trial different systems or tools that they might then say well that's something that they can take and use um, for the business going forward. Does that answer your question? Good. Hello. Uh, no, it's, it's about trialling them for Highways England. So the point is, what we need to do is what's right for the project, but part of that can then be a trial for Highways England. That is, is that a tool that they would want to keep and use um, because it has benefit to them as a business going forward, or is it something that's only beneficial to um, the, that project? So the scale and complexity of the CRM system, for example, is, is of an order of magnitude at the moment that's bigger than Highways England would need on any of their other jobs. So is that something that we just use for Lower Thames or is it something that creates a legacy capability for Highways England going forward? So we're not trialling them on the project, we're trialling them on behalf, potentially trialling them on behalf of Highways England for the wider business benefit. Hello? Hi, uh, Are you looking at... Uh Project like to, to get lessons learned, to, you know, to avoid some mistakes or something. Like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's really important to us that um, that we learn lessons from other major projects. So yes, Crossrail, Thames Tideway, uh, HS2. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All of those projects that are more advanced than us. It's also equally important um, that we're able to share information back with other projects that are following on behind us. So both within Highways England. Um, so, for example, there's a, um, uh, a good relationship that, um, that's going on between ourselves and the M4 uh, Smart Motorways programme. Um, we also talk regularly to the A303 project, the A14 project. So we do that within Highways England because it's really important that you know, we share that benefit between, our, between each of the projects. Um, but you know, th these are all major government infrastructure projects. It's incredibly important that we share the lessons and the benefits. Hello. You said a mixture of public and private finance. What controls are in place and what are the controls in place to ensure the benefits that you can expect from the private sector and public finance? We're not funding that. We're not funding the private sector. Um, so at the moment we're on preliminary design. So we're working through the commercial and procurement strategy and, and how that might look. Um, so uh, one of the things that Terry Harrington said earlier was that um, Highways England looking at, at PF2. Um, at the moment, no firm decision has been made about whether the project is going to be wholly publicly financed or whether an element of it will be pri privately financed. She did talk about that this morning. Um, as we progress forward, we will work out what those control mechanisms need to be. That's a bit of a get out answer, but <laughs> the short one is I don't know yet. <laughs> yes, I could have just said that, couldn't I? Hello. Uh, 
I guess what I would take away from, from what you've said is, is um, there, there is significant complexity on the project. You know, we, we have some really significant work streams and uh, maintaining the integration between those work streams and, and keeping very, very clear what the interfaces are between those work streams is critical. Um, part of what the project is doing is looking at the user charging assumptions. Um, those will need to feed into the statutory consultation process. Well, yeah, but um, there's, so some people are going to object and some people are going to think it's a good thing. Um, and, you know, working through that whole process to come up with a solution that um, provides a reasonable response and gets, delivers the benefits that the project needs to deliver, you know, is vitally important. Hello? Hello. Uh, you mentioned a preliminary, preliminary uh, budget number. I think it was 4.4 .4 to 6.6 .6 billion, or to, to that effect. 6.2. 6.2 billion. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, early and conceptual design? Some of the process of coming out with uh, an initial conceptual estimate, and maybe even making it public on a on a 10-year project, and, and some of the risks, uh, uh, you know, that maybe are included or not included. Um, so that um, that number that of 4.4 .4 to 6.2 billion was um, the figure that was declared at the end of the option stage. Um, we haven't formally declared uh, anything different to that yet. Um, obviously, the design is evolving. Um, specifications are, are being identified, so um, we will update that. That figure included um, a, a range of uncertainty and um, assumptions about. Um, risks on the project. So um, it, it, it follows the same process that you would follow in any project. It's just that you end up with much bigger numbers um, and much bigger, you know, the range has a far greater impact because, you know, that 4.4 .4 to 6.2 is a 1.8 billion pound um, range, which, you know, some people might find a little difficult to understand. Uh, but you have to go through um, the, the, the design process. Um, to get the degree of certainty. Uh, and, and that, again, you know, that's part of the stage going insurance review process um, that Highways England have it, has in place. Um, and uh, as Terry said earlier, they've got the project controls framework. Um, so um, the process of developing the maturity of the scope and the design and therefore uh, refining the estimate range is an iterative one that's really well defined um, by Highways England. Um, and, it, it, you know, we engage with subject matter experts in each of those different areas for each one of those products that exist in the project controls framework. So that as we're progressing through the design process, those people are, are um, assigning themselves to the outputs that we're developing and we're locking those down and agreeing them. So the idea is that as you get to that next stage gain assurance review, a lot of the, the um, authorization and approval that you need is already committed. Any other questions? <coughs> no? Okay. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>